Oh yeah, Dragon Quest ain't going nowhere. But, uh, we will run out of Dragon Quest to talk about eventually. After a lot of thinking, I've decided I like this format. I like walking through a series entry by entry, comprehending the hows and whys it changed. It was convenient that my first retrospective series involved a chain of quests that led me down a path of personal growth, discovery, and I think the tone and the passion I found doesn't need to stop there. We go on quests every day of our lives. So what's one more? Welcome to Questrospective, a journey through many lands of all shapes and sizes. I'm GC, your host on this virtual caravan. Join me now as we travel to a world of crime and suspicion, of gangsters and despots, of humanity, parenthood, and finding hope in a dark place. I introduce to you Yakuza. It's the end of the 20th century when Shenmue is released onto the Sega Dreamcast and cements itself as the forefather of the open world genre, striving for realism all the way down to establishing timetables for NPCs and various shops in the game, Shenmue inspired a slew of franchises after its release. Two years later, Grand Theft Auto 3 emerged in 2001 with similar ideas but showcased a darker kind of realism centered around criminals and the underside of society. Grand Theft Auto 3 gained notoriety for its gratuitous violence, sparking worldwide controversy, but where many saw only the glorification of murder and crime, one unlikely individual amongst the cautious masses saw potential for a game that turned our gaze to harsh realities. That man was Toshihiro Nagoshi, creator of Super Monkey Ball and Daytona USA, and apparently harboring some very intense thoughts behind his cute monkeys. Now this is a picture of Nagoshi before Yakuza. Uh, this is a rare Nagoshi? Congratulations on receiving this blessing. Seemingly inspired by GTA's willingness to present the darker sides of society unabashedly and disgusted by its remorseless enjoyment and unapologetic violence, Nagoshi set forth to realize an idea he'd been sitting on as a response to GTA a video game that could handle the subject matter better and without lionizing it. After three years of development under the codename Project J, Ryuga Gotoku, or Like a Dragon, was announced to a small group of journalists and industry professionals at a club located in Kabukicho, a red light district inside Tokyo Shinjuku district that the game's setting Kamurocho is based off of. Now this is a picture of Nagoshi after Yakuza. This Nagoshi, as you can see, is well done. The first Yakuza opens with an establishing shot of Kamurocho, exciting nightlife, neon lights, and the dangers hidden within their hot glow. Enter one Kazuma Kiryu, respected captain of the Dojima family and precious sea urchin of my heart. During a simple collection run with his subordinate Shinji, we learn a lot about Kiryu. A penchant for being a badass, intimidating, and on his way up the ranks in the Tojo clan, close to starting a family of his own. On his way to take the money back to the Dojima offices, we learn about Kiryu's support group, the people he cares for the most, Nishiki and Yumi. The three of them were orphans who grew up under the guardianship of one Shintaro Kazama, a fellow captain of the Dojima family. These scenes show us two sides of the man, the fearless, invincible dragon of Dojima, and a Kiryu surrounded by camaraderie and love in his life. Right up until the narrative needs to move along, In an effort to protect Yumi from their captain's assault, Nishiki murders Dojima, and to protect the two people he cares about the most, Kiryu takes the fall, allowing Nishiki to take Yumi and leave. Refusing to tell anyone the truth of what happened, Kiryu is sent to prison and returns to Kamurocho ten years later, excommunicated from the Tojo clan in a city he can barely recognize and his loved ones distant, missing, or against him. Kiryu's excommunication also takes away the opportunity to start his own family within the clan, and that metaphor is pretty blatant. Yakuza might share themes of family with Dragon Quest, but it's cynical and uses it to highlight the tragedies many of us go through. Kiryu has lost his family, and with it, the world as he knew it. When your surroundings are no longer familiar to you, it's time to get reacquainted. At first, the mosaic of brightly colored tiles on your map act as beacons to your objectives. Then, you notice Camarocho is split into three big chunks, each with their own fast travel point resting on edges of the map. Sitting the fast travel points on the outside of the city was intentional. Rather than have you teleport from every key location, Yakuza encouraged you to explore Camarocho and familiarize yourself with its various landmarks. 
Walk past it enough times and you'll never forget where Theater Square is, that the batting cages are also in the Hotel District, or that the Champions District is a little east off the northern end of Pink Avenue. In fact, I'll make a bet. If you've played Yakuza before, I bet you can tell me where each of the three parks in Kamurocho are and how to get to them. Nagoshi's team was clearly invested in players knowing Kamurocho. And yeah, that's nothing special, every game should do that, but it was the sudden clarity after developing your own mental GPS that made the concept in Yakuza so compelling. If the story asked you to meet someone in front of the coin lockers, you'd be able to walk there without looking at your map first. If you needed to heal or buy items, you'd know which corner to turn for the nearest item shop. Forget whatever you were doing at the destination. Half of the satisfaction from playing Yakuza was getting somewhere without having to ask for directions. Those were proud moments and a great facilitator for identifying with Kiryu. As the game progresses, he starts recognizing his home again in the same way you do, and Kamurocho helps that association by making real-life brands the common factor. Yakuza is rife with product placement to ground it in our reality. The level of authenticity it wanted to get across is immediately discernible if you walk into any of the stores in Kamurocho. Nagoshi's team wanted real-life magazines Kiryu could pull off the shelf and read, faithful interiors for pachinko parlors and club segas, and store jingles when you walked into a total recreation of a Don Quixote. And that store jingle was boppin'. They managed to get the licensing for Suntory products and use that contract as an excuse to have bartenders educate you on the alcohol you could purchase in-game. And the research team spent an ungodly amount of time in hostess bars, so a lot of what you read in the hostess bar scenes are things actual hostesses said to them. Yeah, sure. Research. The city's strongest element is its population. Kamurocho feels like a real place because it knows how real people behave. For that, we have to thank Hase Seishu, the scenario writer that converted Nagoshi's storyline into what we recognize as Yakuza's plot for assisting the team in constructing a realistic city. Nagoshi brought Seishu on board in order to help with the authenticity of Kamurocho, and Seishu was ideal for the job, being a crime drama author who had studied and written stories about the violence in Kabukicho. With his help, Kamurocho drew breath along its streets and came alive, a bustling nightlife identified by its hotspots and fashion. You could hear pieces of the conversations people were having as you walked past them on the street, giving you an idea of the crowd that frequented the place. And once in a while, above the noise of the masses, you could hear someone loudly exclaim something much in the way you would in real life. And the tissue peddlers and barkers forcing ads into your hands and nagging you to come to their bar are a nuisance that I never thought someone could recreate so accurately. All of this is assisted by Yakuza's insistence on having characters with non-idealized appearances. The people of Yakuza look like real people. Imperfect faces and wonky noses and pinheads and ugly ass moles on their faces. Everyone in Yakuza, like in the real world, is ugly as fuck. Except Kiryu, he's gorgeous and perfect, like me, so the parallels are spot on. Getting to know the city, getting to know the people, and getting to know Kiryu through it firmly planted your feet in the game's setting. The suspension of disbelief was all powerful in Yakuza, and it needs to be, because the story being told in Yakuza doesn't just jump the shark, it puts the shark in space and then flies a rocket over them. Kiryu learns that the third chairman, which just means big boss, of the Tojo clan is dead, and 10 billion yen, which rounds up to about 100 million dollars US in 2005, wow, exchange rates are complicated sometimes, has gone missing. With new instructions to meet with Shintaro at the third chairman's funeral, Kiryu, a target of his former family members, must sneak into the wake to learn more about what's happened to Nishiki and the others. That's right, he can't just wait until the funeral's over to talk to his dad, he has to sneak into the wake. Because reasons. He discovers that Yumi has been missing for 10 years, and is responsible for the missing 10 billion yen. Before he can get the whole story from him, however, Kazuma is shot by an unknown sniper. And when the entire Tojo clan finds Kiryu standing over a wounded captain, 
he has no choice but to fight his way out. The Yakuza of the Tojo clan, the dangerous life that Kiryu used to be a part of, the corruption and violence of the world he lives in, is now trying to reclaim him. Now, 10 billion yen is a big number, but the money itself isn't important. Something of value has been lost to the people in this story. Luckily for Kiryu, 10 years away from it all has helped him realize that. And in the midst of this discovery, as he searches for a way to find it before they do, he finds a little girl named Haruka. The very first innocent thing this little girl asks from this hardened, tired ex-gangster is to save a poor, defenseless puppy. Which gives us one of the greatest title cards in existence. Kiryu, not yet knowing that what he's searching for has just been found, can't help but do so. And he's going to help the only way he knows how. By fucking somebody up! Today's been a very bad day. And it's put me in a real shitty mood. What? Just your bad luck to have run into me. Whether it's because he's a marked enemy of the Yakuza or the mark of an unsuspecting con artist, Kiryu constantly fights to survive. And fight is the correct word to use in this case. This wasn't Nagoshi's first attempt at making a lean, mean street fighting machine. The engine for combat in Yakuza was built from scratch, but it was designed after Spike Out, an arcade game Nagoshi worked on. During production, he said he wanted to focus less on creating beautiful battles and more on accentuating the brutality of the fighting itself to make what he insisted be called fights in the game gritty and uncomfortable to watch. Yakuza seemed to be a straightforward beat-em-up game. You had a punch and kick button acting as light and heavy attacks respectively, heavy attacks being used as combo finishers at the end of a string of light attacks. You had a grab that you could chain more attacks into or throw your enemies with, a guard, a target lock, and a dodge. Now, most people will tell you that fighting in Yakuza could get clunky, and they're right. Kiryu was slow and heavy, and enemies got knocked out of your combos before you could finish them. At times, fighting multiple enemies at once became a situation of hit and run, where you weren't able to get your combos going because someone else smacked you from behind and knocked you down. You couldn't spam the dodge button, and Kiryu was often locked into his combat animations. But Yakuza was painfully aware of this, for the most part. See, that whole thing about enemies moving out of your combos, that wasn't unintended. That's a feature. It was a mechanic in the game that even players could utilize to get out of enemy combos too. The number of enemies you were fighting at once? Feature. There were several enemy types in the game, some of which were harder to throw or more likely to sidestep out of one of your attacks. In any fight that happened in Yakuza, you had to identify the enemy types and deal with each one accordingly, sometimes using other enemies as tools. It's almost like this was some kind of RPG. All right, that's what it fucking is. Getting locked into combat animations and not having a spammable dodge? It's because you had to time those dodges carefully and know when to commit to making an attack. It was about freeing up the room and using those small windows of opportunity in the fight to knock out a gunman or take advantage of the heat system. Yakuza didn't want you to button mash recklessly. It expected concentrated effort and careful decision making. You didn't need to get a full combo off, you just needed to build and maintain your heat meter. If you did, you unlocked heat moves, the real force behind Kiryu's strength. Super damaging, high style executions that were triggered by utilizing context sensitive weapons or the environment. Or you could keep the meter filled. As an alternative to spending heat, Kiryu's moveset improved when he was, uh, oh, when he was in heat? Oh my cousin, a chance to lewd. In this way, with all these enemies possessing different immunities and the constant balance of spending and building heat while also paying attention to enemy attacks and your surroundings in order to land heat moves at the right time, fighting in Yakuza was incredibly satisfying. The real penalty for taking hits in Yakuza wasn't losing health. The game provided you with plenty of space for healing items, and keeping Kiryu alive was more about resource management than it was about avoiding attacks. But getting knocked down or stuck inside a combo made your heat meter plummet, and not being able to get it up again was almost always the reason why you'd find yourself sitting at a game over screen. Or alone on a Friday night!
The upgrade trees in Yakuza all expanded Kiryu's heat capabilities, opening up a greater variety of moves and diminishing heat penalties. By the end game, Kiryu's moveset was so fleshed out from upgrades and discoverable abilities that he played totally different to what's available at the start, giving a true sense of character development. He became surprisingly fluid, with an ample selection of options to deal with whatever situation, and it all relied on having a consistent amount of heat available to him. It's less about feeling like a powerhouse, and more about feeling like a martial arts master. You're not invincible or unstoppable, but you can prove to be so adaptable that you might as well be. But Yakuza never escaped that clunky feeling, even when that fluidity got introduced. There was always a little something to remind you of how stiff it could be. Beyond hand-to-hand -hand combat, there was a whole selection of weapons and special items that Kiryu could bring into fights with him, and enemies often carried their own. This included firearms. The combat engine didn't seem to have been designed with guns in mind. One shot from any of them would knock Kiryu down and almost totally drop your heat meter, and running to get rid of those enemies was a pain since guns in Yakuza very rarely ever missed as Kiryu moved slowly across the screen. And while manageable, the camera in Yakuza was finicky and made spotting enemies with guns or bosses preparing special moves difficult. Chapter 2 of the story involved an awful stealth section where the game uses its intentionally wide AI detection for its random battle system as the detection zones for each enemy, and it was so early that it could have deterred new players from advancing the story. Chapter 9 had a light gun section that felt tacked on and used the D-pad to aim. The D-pad? for a light gun game. What? And navigating the city is fun, but rather than an over-the-shoulder camera, each section of Camarocho is divided into multiple camera cuts with different angles and forms of tracking Kiryu. This was probably done because of the limitations of the PS2 hardware, since there's also this awkward buffer between screens. It made it jarring when transitioning from one camera angle to the next, and was prone to making players fall in and out of the same area more than once. Many Yakuza connoisseurs, if you will, will also say that the English dub in Western copies of Yakuza is a sign of the times. Stilted line delivery, some awful reads, and the total butchering of the original script by adding more swearing and changing characters' names into just their honorifics makes playing Yakuza in English eh, difficult for many people. But I kind of like it. Mark Hamill's in it. By the way, what do you want me to do with this brick. I didn't know he was Kazuma-san. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah? I didn't know. Forget it. You're too kind. Kazuma-chan, too kind. We gotta make up for this. How? I should kill you. Stupid! Fucking! Motherfucker! This is post-Batman animated series Mark Hamill. Post-Batman animated series Mark Hamill would not be delivering his lines like this unless it was because they had to lip-sync to character animations. If you pay attention to the way cutscenes are acted, it's very clear this was the case. Interestingly enough, it wasn't the quality of the English dub itself that Sega blamed for Yakuza's low sales numbers in the West. It was how the localization was handled. The first trailer showing off the English voice acting was using an incomplete and unmastered soundtrack, resulting in terrible audio quality. Before Sega could do its damage control, the trailer had spread to so many news sites that the PR was irreversible. Add the fact that the PS2 disc wasn't big enough to hold both language tracks, and it all comes together to leave a bad taste in your mouth. Why is this a big deal? For a game trying to be as authentically Japanese as possible, this was Yakuza's biggest blunder. The localization team threw out authenticity in an attempt to make it more accessible to their Western audience, but authenticity was exactly what the audience in question was looking for. The transcription we got accentuated that clunky feeling and lessened the impact of some of the more emotional scenes. You were... my real father! <laughs> yeah, okay. There's plenty of wrinkles on Yakuza 1. While it still holds up today, it hasn't aged gracefully. But the way Yakuza handles its side quests has. It turns out that Haruka is the secret to getting the 10 billion yen, and Nishiki reveals that he ordered the hit on Kazuma in order to buy some time to find her. Through her, Kiryu learns that Haruka's mother is Yumi's sister, and her aunt Yumi gave her a special locked pendant to keep safe for her. It's at this point that we all roll our eyes and figure out the plot twists in Yakuza way before they happen. But I don't think that's the point. Let's get this out of the way. 
Yumi is Haruka's mother. I know it, you know it, it's obvious. At first it's asinine for Kiryu not to connect the dots right away, but he's already begun to walk away from the cynicism in the world around him. Rather than doubt what she says, Kiryu believes Haruka. He believes in Haruka and follows her line of thinking because he sees something inside of her worth preserving. The pendant is important, but not because it's the key to a pendant-shaped lock on a safe that has tons of money in it. That pendant is Haruka's source of hope. It's a keepsake that maintains her innocence, and our man Kiryu will die before anyone lays a single finger on Haruka to get to it. Even though she gets kidnapped a thousand times, but that's not the point. As Kiryu digs deeper to uncover the truth, we see a man rediscover his innocence. We witness a gradual climb out of one's own darkness and that of their surroundings. The signs that among these people who've long let go of the idea of being better, there are still plenty of them who uphold those values. Many of the side quests we do with Haruka in tow show us the heroes of Kamurocho, the people doing their best to make living in a crime-ridden city a little less hopeless, and before long, Kiryu gets added to that list. For someone used to the railroaded way newer video games make their side quests, the way Yakuza did it might leave a bad impression. From that perspective, Yakuza's side quests were hard to find, hard to complete, and hard to get right. With the exception of a few larger ones, the side quests were scattered about Kamurocho without any markers or arrows pointing towards them. It was up to you to find them while wandering through the streets of Kamurocho doing literally anything else. Maybe those thugs you bump into near Theater Square aren't just another random battle. Maybe they're cleverly placed NPCs meant to harass you in a long string of side quests over the course of you playing the game. What's more, Yakuza did something that, even back when it was made, took a serious set of glands to do. You could fail a side quest, and that would be it. Side quest over. You failed. With Yakuza using save points at predetermined locations, it would have been more than likely for players to unexpectedly encounter a new side quest and fail it before they ever got the chance to save their progress up to that point. Imagine playing for a solid three hours and having a side quest dialogue choice determine whether or not you were going to reload. I don't think these are problems with the way Yakuza handles its side quests. I think these are really big hints about what those side quests are for. This was the team's way of adding an organic element to every individual's playthrough. With about 80 side quests spread out between different chapters and areas of Kamurocho, little in the way of hints as to where they were, and hundreds of ways to fail them, there was no possibility of you and another player having the exact same set of side quests with the exact same outcomes. Sure, there was a secret boss for succeeding in every side quest, but speaking from experience, I can promise you that it wasn't worth it and probably not intended for many people to do. The quests weren't there to give you decent items or experience. Most of them didn't. In fact, most of them wouldn't be worth the time it took to do them if it weren't for how well they assisted in understanding our beloved main character. There was a general rule of thumb you could use to avoid failing too many side quests in Yakuza. What would Kiryu do? He wouldn't take shit from anybody, he would never let someone extort him, and he'd never let his guard down. Even if you were surprised by a side quest encounter, correctly acting like Kiryu in those situations kept you from failing them, and that's a neat way of encouraging further understanding of the character you're controlling. Each one had small defining moments for what kind of person Kiryu is, and the kind of person he feels society has made him out to be. Side quests also provided us something else. The weirder, sillier side of Yakuza, and the silver lining of the world it portrays. Almost all of them possess some kind of gag or punchline at the end of them, and that's a stark contrast to the brooding plot and characters we've been discussing. This is, in a big way, thanks to Hiroyuki Sakamoto, the sub-scenario writer for the original Yakuza. In an interview published on 1UP, Sakamoto said, We tried to keep the feeling of the game that was created through the main scenario. The nice thing is, we didn't have to keep everything in a strict form or pattern. We were able to do things that weren't possible in the main story. Sakamoto helped maintain the main narrative's balance between realism and levity by providing smaller stories that were totally separate from its conflicts. Within each one, a glimpse of one of the most powerful things you could walk away with after playing Yakuza. And I'm not talking about learning to laugh at the bizarre situations we sometimes find ourselves in. In one particular quest called the Matchstick Girl, all you have to do is buy a pack of matches from this woman and then come back later. She explains that her boyfriend dumped her right before Christmas, gives you a present, that's it. But you made that girl's day. You made her feel appreciated despite the awful thing that happened to her. This one side quest, without shoehorning a battle into it, without giving you any real challenge or incentive to do it, perfectly captures what I love about Yakuza, what I think I've learned from it. 
Yakuza is about accepting hope, about finding reasons to persevere in a broken world. A whole bunch of plot twists and story developments happen even all the way up until the very last boss fight. There's a lot of great moments with Haruka and Kiryu learning about parenting and people dying. There's a scene with a stripper and a shotgun, all good stuff. To make things short, this man who looks an awful lot like Kiryu if Kiryu was a bad guy arrives to collect the money that he stole that was stolen from him and then Nishiki shows up because he wants to fight Kiryu to prove that he's better than him because he's angry that Yumi doesn't like him because Yumi is in love with Kiryu this whole time. The forehead mole is Haruka's father because Yumi had amnesia and fell in love with him but then he went evil and paranoid and Shintaro knew Yumi was safe the whole time and because reasons. Here's the idea. Kiryu's journey of discovery is coming to a close. He ascends Millennium Tower, named in honor of a new era, to reunite the innocence he's discovered and cared for throughout the game with her mother, the driving force behind Kiryu's actions in the first place. When he gets there, he's challenged by two opposing forces. Nishiki, who went down the opposite path, a representation of what would have been had Kiryu continued his life as a Yakuza, a walking embodiment of his past and close reminder of who he was, and Jingu, a man who cares not for the innocence born from himself, a representation of the cold world below, an ideal that, should it win, confirms the futility in trying to rise above it. After a couple of boss fights, Kiryu finds himself at Jingu's mercy and is unable to do anything against this force for what he desperately fights against. But here's a twist you didn't see coming. Even the people that go down the wrong path need to believe in the goodness of humanity. Nishiki. I can't let this bastard get what he wants. And if you believe in that good, if you believe that protecting it against what's wrong in the world and nurturing it is worth surviving any evil, then maybe you've always had it inside you. Stand up and protect the one thing worth fighting for. Yeah, what Goofy said! At that reveal in Kabukicho, Nagoshi was quoted saying, For a while now, I've wanted to create a powerful, gritty drama where you feel the sense of humanity. And I think he nailed it. The world is rough. It's dangerous, it'll take advantage of you if you let it. But sometimes it can be silly. Sometimes it rides a fine line between both. And sometimes we get the opportunity to make it a better place. In this grim world of liars and criminals, any amount of kindness counts. Whether it's reuniting a girl with her mother, saving a puppy, or spending a dollar on a pair of matches. My fondness for the Yakuza series isn't just because it's Gonzo, and it's not just because I enjoy the style of gameplay. There are so many stories being told, so many different ideas to walk away from it with. I don't have time to talk about all of them, but I can show you mine, and hopefully that convinces you to find your own. I'm GC. Thank you for questing with me.